All right, everybody, away we go. Welcome to today's call. It is Friday. Uh, geez, I forgot what month it was already. February. Can you believe that? February 2nd of 2018, and this is the TRC sales training call. And behind me on the board, if you're broadcasting live on Facebook with me, um, and if not, uh, I'll just describe it here. Something that came up this week was, especially with my own team, I'll slide over here for a second, especially with my own team, was that the the idea of sales is that you have to have very clear sales goals. And I think sometimes we make too much about those goals. We try to make them too complicated. A simple gross commission goal is something that I think is really important for all of us to set. You want to pay very, very close attention to setting that goal and, and get yourself set up there because you, you, you can have all of the details get in the way of seeing far out into the distance several months from now, and in this case, really already down to 11 months left before the end of the year arrives and you see if you've arrived at that goal. And I think it's key to, to have that and, and because you don't really know, have to know in the beginning how you're going to get there. I know that sounds crazy, but that's very true. You, you just have to start. That's the most important thing. You have to get going and you have to start. So the lens through which you see the goal is everything. And that's come up a lot lately. That's come up on our weekly sales training call. It's come up in my Griffin Realty Group meetings, on the campfire meeting, the mastermind what you're shooting for, all the goals I get it are different. We might have some folks that are listening into this that are brand new. They've never sold a piece of real estate. And then there's others that are frustrated that they can't sell more than 300 houses because that's their brokerage or their team that's budding. Whatever it is, it all starts with how you see yourself today. If you're not getting a bigger goal or you're not moving towards a bigger goal, there's a reason for that. And that's because the way that you see your ability to achieve that is tainted. And I want to deal with that early and often on the sales training call here today, right? So what I expect today is participation. We've had a couple of people that have carried this group all by themselves. And I expect that to be all of you, not just a few of you. So especially if you're part of the Griffin Realty Group and you're on this call, I would be expecting that you are speaking up and throwing me a bone of about what, what it is that you need me to help you work on. We've done a lot of training when it comes to scripting and we've built out all sorts of formulas. We can certainly talk about that. But today, I want to talk about you and your sticking point. That's all that matters to me. I have a desperate feeling to help each person that participates in this way in, in, in a very deep and meaningful way so that when, you, when you're done with these calls or anywhere where we train, you can immediately go out and make something happen in a positive way, okay? So I'm gonna open up the microphones. Remember, star six, mute your mic if you're in the call. Star seven, unmute it if you're online today. You can post questions up there and I'll get those as I see them roll along. All right, here we go. All right, I need a volunteer, somebody to sit in this spot with me and tell me what is their biggest challenge when it comes to believing that they can do something or hit a certain goal. Remember, if you have a loud microphone, I need you to star six it so I don't have to do it. All right, go ahead. Who's up? Somebody in the hot seat. Sorry, I got one hot mic there. In the hot seat. Somebody, come on now. I'll sit here in silence until you're uncomfortable. <laughs> Let's go. Hey, Danny, it's Lisa. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I'm sorry, I missed your first question there, but I'll jump in the hot seat. Well, I what, love you. What's the topic today? Awesome, good for you. The bottom line is, and Leslie's been really working on this too, and you both have, it's that whole lens through which we see what is possible. So as you look at your goals, let's first say this. Lisa, do you have a very clear GCI goal that you'd like to hit before the end of the year arrives? Um, and I'm probably going to get this number wrong, but the GCI is my gross total commission. Gross. Yeah. Before splits with Paul, like the, just the, the gross, the gross number. Do you have a number? I'm sorry. I would like it to be 400,000. Okay. All right. So, so 400,000. Hey guys, star six me. If it's loud where you are, please star six. Okay. Star six. It's important that everybody can hear this. She'd like it to be 400,000. Okay. Now, my job is to do two things here, is number one, not to rain on your parade. I believe that a big, hairy, audacious goal as articulated in the book Scaling Up is a good concept, okay? I, I like it. I like the 400,000, 
But what I'm looking for is something that you can most definitely achieve based on, let's start with average. Lisa, do you believe that in Birmingham, Michigan, you can at least perform on, a, on an average level, yes or no? Yes. Okay, in Birmingham, Michigan, do you have any idea how many millions of dollars the average agent sells? Answer's probably no, but can you take an educated guess? Uh, I think there's a, a pretty big split. So I think you've got more of the part-time agents or agents who are probably pulling in maybe a hundred to two hundred thousand, and then you've got the other top agents in the area who are pulling in one to two million. All right, I'm going to tell you you're way overstating it. No. I'll guarantee you you are way overstating it. Really? Now, yeah, way by a lot, by a lot. Here's why: the law of averages is true. And it's sort of an immutable fact. So that if we were to look at the entirety, let's just take the United States. We won't take our Canadian friends in this group because I don't know their global stats. But I think the, the National Association of Realtors, and one of you can Google it while we're doing the call, states that there's about 1.3 million real estate licensees who have joined the association and call themselves realtors, right? So as you're looking at that, you're saying to yourself, all right, so... There's 1.3 million. What does the average realtor sell in the course of a year for number of transactions? Anybody can weigh in on this. If any of you have the stats, you can Google the NAR um, report that comes out. Anybody give me the number of, of, of uh, the average number. And I'm, I'm only trying to build your model off of average. And then we can go for the big, hairy, audacious goal. Okay? Because I think the problem... Well, in, in Michigan... Yep. Go. So Michigan, they say the average realtor makes 40K. Okay. So there you go. So there's your answer. If that, the, that's the average. Now that's skewed up by the good ones and skewed down by the bad ones. That's a real average. We, we can't make up math. It's one of the most dangerous things I think we do as business people and salespeople that need to achieve that goal. So the average produced GCI by, by a realtor in Birmingham, Michigan, is somewhere around $40,000. Is that what you're stating? Yeah, that's what I Googled. Okay, good. There you go. It was a couple weeks ago when I looked at that number. There you go. Now, you just stated... Well, that's just a sad number. Okay. Okay, good. But you have to get there first. You can blow through sad. I've got no problem with that. Now, on my watch, you all better be blowing through sad or right. I flunked, Right. So, but, but you can't just delusionally go and make up, not you, Lisa, I mean, any of us, you can't just delusionally make up numbers, right? And say, hey, I want to do X number of hundreds of thousands when the average that we have to blow through first is 40. And that actually comes up a lot, a lot. A lot. And on the mastermind yesterday, where all these mastermind folks are number one, trying to become mega producers, and I coach mega producers. That's what we do. I am one of them. I did do four hundred and ten thousand dollars last year, plus or minus a few thousand. So I am sitting here telling you that is my personal book of business gross. Okay, so that is true. That it's doable. I have people that I coach that do six fifty. Right. One of them is your fearless leader. So th th there are people that actually generate that, but they don't just generate it on their own. They generate it with systems and help from people and marketing. OK, so let's just be realistic about what the expectation is. But I want you all to be cognizant of what reality is. So what happens is. I think it's okay to state and stop being embarrassed about 40,000 is pathetic, quote unquote, according to us. Okay, but maybe we need 40,000. If you're not on a run rate right now to make 40,000 GCI, then we need to fix that first. If anybody's on this call telling me they're on a run rate doing 650 and they're trying to figure out how to get a million, great, let's have that conversation too. Doesn't matter where you're at, but you have to start in a realistic spot. Where you are is where you are. That's what matters the most. You're starting in that spot. Now, I don't want to embarrass anybody, and I don't want anybody to have to state out loud, but the first goal that we have to hit is something reasonable. So I'm going to start with average. If the average Birmingham realtor, and by the way, I believe that if you look across the country and we eliminate some of the real part-timers, I think forty to sixty thousand dollars is a reasonable range, which would do what, Lisa? It would make it on par with other industries. 
those people that put a real effort in to selling real estate will find themselves selling on average what other average people in other average industries get. You following me so far? You with me? Yeah. Okay. So now the next question is, what is the plan that we have? And how do you see yourself? I like the fact that you just looked through a lens and said, geez, if the goal of average is $40,000, that's pretty sad. That was your word. Okay, so I like the lens through which you're seeing the world of real estate. Now, you'd like to go to 400,000. Is that reasonable over the next 11 months? Is it? I don't think necessarily reasonable over the next 11 months. Like my goal for the first year was to shoot for 100. And then, but I think ultimately, like for me, what's best is if I envision the end result and then figure out all the steps on how to get there. So if I can envision myself on it, when I am successful and have a good base that yeah. I am year, yearly producing around 400K, yeah. good. how do I get from point zero to 400? Good. Awesome. Brilliant. Here we go. Number one, did you reach the 100K in your first year? Yes or no? I'm seven months into it, and no, I'm not on track. And partly because the first few months I was super part time, yep. And I also am brand new to an area, and so learning both the industry and the area was a big task to overcome. And then we had winter, which, as you know, is a little bit tricky here. Um, so I'm ready for spring, and I'm ready now with the knowledge base that I have acquired. Okay, good. So here's the deal. So that's what I'm trying to get you to. And I appreciate you playing the game. Kudos to Paul, because between you and Leslie, you helped me carry these calls. Um, and I really appreciate that. If you're just joining, what we're trying to start off with today is clarifying your GCI goals. As salespeople and as business people, you're insane if you don't know the number you're after and how many transactions, et cetera, um, average commissions. And I'll go through that again here today. You're insane. Okay, I'm insane. We're insane. You cannot get to a goal that you do not have very crooked, clear numbers that relate to. You can't just say, oh, I want to do 400,000. It's, it's, it's too round. It doesn't mean anything to the subconscious. And, and when the subconscious is looking at something that doesn't really mean anything, it doesn't get as resourceful as it could. So let me just say, the key first beat is a run rate. Okay. When you look at when I was in the venture capital industry and, and things were ramping up, we would look at a smaller period of time and say, what's the run rate? You're right, Lisa, all those factors are factors, but a plan being executed is everything. That's everything. And so the goal here is, do you have a sales plan to get to the, the financial goal that you want? And the milestones along the way are, are we hitting as salespeople those milestones? Are they clear to us? Do we know that they're actually happening or not? That's the very, very, very first thing that we have to see. So if your goal, I like the 100,000 better. But stop blowing through these very significant numbers. 40,000 is a significant milestone, depending on what the average sale is. So now let's walk it back a little bit. What is the average sale in Birmingham, Michigan? And again, I know I'm putting you all up against this because you all should be worrying. Uh oh, if he asked me that, I don't know, right? I know on Cape Cod, it's $506,000 different from the median of 398000 I finally know that because I sat still and I focused on real math so that I could help my team and my immediate team achieve my personal book of business goals. So what is it in Birmingham, Michigan? The real average sale. And median's fine, but I want average because if the average skews up like it does for me in Cape Cod and Boston, that means there's super, super, super mega high-end stuff available to be sold by me and by you. So I want the average number if you can give it to me. Do you know what it is? I'm trying to Google this really fast. Um, and their commissions came up, but um, my guess because of the range, it would be between the five and 600,000. Okay, I would get a real number because real numbers will mean something once we see it there. And it's as easy right. as during this call, also going into the MLS, if you can get access, and just running 
all and whatever your product is, if it's condos like it is in Boston mostly or, or houses, run the whole thing and find out what the real math is. Because to get a sales goal written down, we need real math because I'm challenging us to say, let's at first determine what average is. Right? When you're planning correctly, the most important thing is to determine what is the real average. We need those numbers because I have to at least set my sights, especially if I'm new, like you, and I'm new to the area, like you, and now I have winter, like you. All those things I have to deal with, but the thing that gets me there is an executable plan. Otherwise, I'll promise you, What's going to happen to you is you are going to desperately run in 17 different directions every time that you sniff out that somebody may do something. Been there for a long time, long time ago, and you have to stop doing it early and often. So I need some real numbers. And any of you can play this game with me here. If you want to jump into this call that Lisa and I are having, I want to hear from you. Do you know these things? What is your goal? Because I'm going to show all yes, of you. I know the answer now. Go, shoot, go. <laughs> Go. Okay. Um, I was doing some mad research. So the residential average price was six fifty one. Okay. Hondas were three seventy four. Multifamily was five eighty eight, and vacant land was four sixty two. Yeah, those are big numbers. Okay. Now, and it's too many numbers. If you were going to market your unique selling proposition, which is you executing a clear plan, that's all it is. Okay. To whom in those categories would you prefer? Single families, condos, vacant land, right? Okay, bang, there you go. And also why? Residential had the biggest average number, didn't it? Yeah, no? Well, it's not just, it's not just the largest average price point. It's, I think, the largest pool to choose from. Both, excellent, both. You're smart. You're gonna you're gonna have more people buying and selling a house than you are vacant land, condos, yep. or Good. multifamily. Per units, perfect, so. brilliant. Because that's what I'm looking for. Now the next thing is that the the numbers that made that up. Here's how we start to look at goals for GCI, and then we break it down into average sales, average commission rates that we can expect to get the transaction number. Now the next thing is. Is your goal based on a reasonable market area? So in other words, if you look at this right now, is it reasonable to go out and do the number of deals? And I'm on the 100,000. I'm not going to your BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goal of 400 yet. I'm not going there yet. I can't get you there if we're skipping over that many rungs on the ladder. I'll go for the 100. I'll bite. It's a good goal. Now, especially at 600 average. Now, how many single family transactions... Did they compile over the last year to get that 600 and change average sale? That's the next thing you have to determine. And I hope everybody's... 447. How many? 447. Okay. Now, that's a little bit small because you take that number and you double it for the number of transactions. Okay? It's only about 800, 900 transaction sides, buy side, sell side. Right? Right? So it feels like it's it's big, yeah. but whatever you looked at is a little bit small. And I'll tell you why. In our mastermind group, as we did this with the mastermind members up at that level, because these folks are looking to do 250 to a million bucks in their own book of business with leverage. So we say, within which area are you going to market and is it reasonable? Now, remember what I come back to. If the average realtor in Birmingham, Michigan is doing $40,000, right? If that's what they're doing. How many transactions does it take? Well, we can guesstimate. Now, of course, we're going to get into this whole, you know, worry about are we stating commission rates. I know my own personal commission rate was 2.77% blended rate last year. I don't know if you could get Paul's from him to use as your example, but you should. But just use mine for now until you have a real one. So the first thing that you're going to do is take the average sale for residential in that area, you're going to multiply it times 0 0.0277. What are you going to get? Tell me what you get. Remember, if you're joining me late here today, we are goal setting. And if you're not clear on how to set a goal for sales, you're dead right from the start. You'll be a man. Well, what was uh, Zig Ziglar's great line? Why be a wandering um, generality when you can be a meaningful specific? Brilliant line. I love it. Go ahead. I'm waiting for your math. Number 17,577. 17,577. 
Five seven seven is the average commission you could expect there yep. at two point seven. Staggering. Yep. Now take that number and divide it into a hundred thousand, and you have your transactions number. Tell me what you got. Into a thousand. No, no, no. Or take take no sorry. no. Hold on. Into a hundred thousand is your goal. That's your goal. You're going to take the average commission. This is average. We're setting an average, you know, uh, attack here, which is staggeringly big commissions, right? Those are huge. So now you step that into the hundred thousand. You divide that into the hundred thousand. What's the number you get? A hundred thousand. Five point seven. Five point seven deals at the average to hit a hundred thousand dollar goal. How easy does that sound to somebody who has a positive outlook and a positive self image like you? Sounds ridiculously easy. Yes, it does, doesn't it? You see why I'm going through this exercise, everybody? Now, what she said, though. Hey, Danny. Yeah, come on, Chris. Go ahead. Fire in. Finally, someone else. Thank you, buddy. Hey, it's Clint. I used to work the Birmingham market when I lived in Michigan. Yep. And that 460 or whatever sales in Birmingham sounds super high. Yep. Okay. Really I just ran the report on the MLS for the last 365 days. Yep. So and, and you, that's what came up. And you included, yeah. yeah and you and, and you included all of that stuff, right? You know, Danny, it sounds high to me too. I mean, I have people in the Midwest, and I, I don't know where to getting the numbers, but it seems awful high. You mean the when average? Talk about Where we get is a real small town. Oh, right, hold on, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We, we, talking about those numbers. I think we're, okay, I think we're talking about two different things. Chris Kleba has said he has challenged the number of transactions in Birmingham, Michigan, and Gail is is challenging what? The average sale price, Gail? Well, average. So, are we saying that uh, above average is like 800,000? I mean, you're in Southern and Voltaire is in Southern California. That they're probably their average point from six to eight hundred thousand. I'm just thinking, Michigan. That price point. Yeah, yeah Birmingham, Michigan happens to be the center of money, so there are million dollar houses here and quite a few of them above yeah. the five hundred thousand dollar range. Yep. So that average does not surprise me. Now if you go to the next town over, yeah, that number does not make any sense. Uh, so okay. Birmingham well, is absolutely so about, the most expensive so town. What's so great about Birmingham? Well, who cares? Well, wait a minute. Yeah. Who, wait, wait, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. Who cares? I just want to know. Yeah, who cares? I don't care. I don't care. You know why, Gail? All I want is real math. Whatever it is, it is. She's sitting in front of it. I'm going to okay. take her word at it. And and I, and I don't mean to shut you and Chris off. I like that you're challenging her to refine her math. I've got two problems so far. Number one. I think it's small, Chris. If she's looking at 442 sales and twice the many transactions, she's got 800 sides wow. to dive into. Good news is she would only, if that average is right, if she focuses on luxury and down to average, she could crush this place with five to 10 sales. That's all it's going to take. And with the plan that we execute, and since yeah, you're both mastermind power, members, absolutely. right? She could crush it, Gail, just like you. Yeah. Right. So yeah. so that's what I I, I would say. Um, it's it, and Chris, you've been gone from there a long time. So I don't know how much it's gone up downtown Birmingham, Michigan. But, you know, Birmingham, Michigan seems to be that spot. Yeah. By the way, Andy Snow does say something smart here online. She might want to look at the median price as well. Because we do want to see how far they're skewed. Andy's right, because that's a challenge that I had to face here, where I have 398 as a median or middle price, and holy mackerel, we got 506 as an average. I still would ask you, do both, but cheat up. Okay, so you can do the same thing. Just take the 398,000 and then the 2.77%. Get that commission, divide it in. You'll have a higher number of transactions. That would give you a, a range of what you could do. But Andy, good point. But I still would challenge her. And Gail, you know, and Clubber, you know what we talk about at Mastermind. Shoot for luxury. Shoot. It's a game changer and it's no different. It isn't. 
I, I know that sometimes we have to do a lot more fancy marketing to, to display these magnificent properties. I get that part. But as far as process and plan is concerned, it's no different. So go to the luxury end of things because as sales, that's going yeah. to have you, you know, do less transactions like Tony was saying yesterday, right, Gail? Right. And so let's just say that you do more transactions. So, for example, right. if I did, you know, five, ten, eight million dollar ones instead of, I mean, it doesn't limit you from doing more, but the fact is, is that once you get on a roll doing luxury, you can do a lot more. Right. For sure. Yeah, For well, sure. To be honest, that is, that is the trickiest part is breaking into that luxury market because there's such a stronghold of realtors that have been in this industry for so long. So I am literally trying to grab the skirt tails of Paul and saying, you know, using his statistics and that he's luxury home certified and bringing him on appointments if I can get them set. But it's literally trying to crack open the luxury home in Birmingham is a tough one. How do you know that? How do you know that? Let's go back to your lens yeah, for a second. I, I wanted, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How do you know that? How do you know it's difficult? Because because I've been calling and prospecting and trying to talk with them and? for months. And? Yeah, and, and I don't have a million dollar listing yet, although I did okay. go on two million dollar listing appointments, one of which um, was more of a probate situation where he was just had so much on his plate because he had multiple properties and he's waiting until the spring to list. So I've just been staying in contact with him. Um, so I'm not saying that I haven't had that opportunity. It's not going to manifest itself. It just hasn't yet. Well, the irony is you did say it. The irony is you did say it, but your yeah. actions did not say it, which I love because your actions are something very different. And, and this is a key part of sales yourselves. Ironically, in this case, you're executing the plan very well. You're picking up the phone and not listening to that nonsense. And Leslie, you're online too. I don't know if you're in the call too. We went through this with her on Campfire just yesterday. Both of you are in Birmingham, Michigan. By the way, Leslie found out 433.5 is the median price according to Zillow at least. We can look that up in MLS. So the median price or middle price is 433. Still a big number and, and still um, exciting yeah. an opportunity, right, Gail? So there you go, Kleba. Um, th there's a couple of numbers. You probably should move home because it's too cheap down in North Carolina. You should have known that when you moved. <laughs> right you, big wimp big wimp he moved down there for the weather and he my left in michigan my in Birmingham. Yeah. yeah you better move home because like all that soft weather and those soft shoes and slippers and stuff has made you soft right so ladies back to you there's a lot of snow waiting for you here yeah exactly uh, yeah ladies back to you okay all three of you gail stay in the hot seat with these ladies you're a good mentor for these two all right because they're newer here's the deal all right here's the deal the most important thing is what we say to ourselves, but you can't make up delusional stories that are, you know, they're, they're fiction. Let's get back to nonfiction. Nonfiction says somewhere between 433 and skewed by perhaps a lot of high-end sales, we've got somewhere maybe in the sixes for average. That sounds like it could be right. Let's take median for middle number. It sounds like it happens a lot right around 433. It's still a wonderful number. A lot of people are envious that are living somewhere where it's a lot, a lot less. So there's your numbers. There are your numbers. And, and that's reality, okay? So you, you're, 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 your average is 40,000. Across the country, it says that the average realtor is, is somewhere around 40,000. We're not going to fret the exact number at the moment, but that's where it is. We all think, ugh, guy could never live off of that. Great, wonderful. But it's still a reality that you have to put on the table and say the reality is this gets all watered down. And don't say, but most people are part-time, but this. Stop saying it. It is what it is. Stop explaining away fact. That's math and statistics. 40,000 is what it is. 100,000 for any realtor looking to lean in and do this job in a very aggressive, detailed way is a good goal. Go ahead and do that. Whoop, hang on. Hang on. Sorry, guys. Somebody had. Guys, watch. Guys, watch your mics for me so I don't have to police them so I can stay on this here. Okay, just star six if you mute your mic, uh, then I don't have to hear the noise. So now, the point is this. Danny? Yep. Hold on, Leslie. The point is this. If we just have this real math, we can blow through it. 
That's the exciting part. If you start with the real math, see if Michael Gerber was sitting here doing the sales training, he would say, whoa, 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 whoa. How does the business really work first? Before we get into what you want and what you need and how you're going to do it, how does the business work? Let's roll back and everybody get a 300 foot view of the real estate agent business. The average agent can expect to make $40,000. Who cares where they are and how they do it? That's just what the law of averages provides us to work with. I think that most of you would say as new realtors, okay, I would love to at least get to 100,000. Wonderful, do your math in your local area. You're looking for an area to market into and to pay attention to that's not too big and not too small. What's that mean? I would prefer as your guide, you found an area, so she has Birmingham, she might have to go out one more concentric circle around there or one zip that's contiguous and find about 1,000 plus or minus sales. That gives you 2,000 transactions. The reason I say that is because also, what can a top producer achieve as a percentage of those transactions? So now you go, all right, let's go back to these top producers who are in this very mastermind at the TRC doing 250, 650, whatever. How many transactions does it take them in that marketplace to become a top producer? That will give you your big, hairy, audacious goal which should be to match those cats in your marketplace. So how much of the market do they control as a percentage? What is their average sale? How did they get there? So you see, we have the general average of the industry. We have the average in the marketplace you want, which I say, look about a thousand transactions wide. And then we have the big dogs. You follow me, Lisa? It's all math. It's all right there. And yeah. instead of running around going, oh, I'm going to go to this class and I'm going to learn this thing and I'm on that webinar. Why? Sit still, do the math, figure it out. Then we start hitting the execution of very basic plans, which, by the way, you stated you were doing. And Leslie, you're going to jump in here too. Leslie stated she was doing, yet when I asked her yesterday... If she were sitting in front of a seller, what would she say? And this is my segue into what to say. What would you say? Well, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to do things. That's exactly what came out of her mouth. After week, after week, after week of saying, look, we have a seven-step strategic plan for sellers and a six-step strategic plan for buyers. Stick to that. People want clarity and concise plans and that's how we execute the plan, which you were doing with the guy in the probate. You were picking up the phone. You were talking to this guy and it was going just fine. He didn't clobber you over the head at all by saying to you, well, Lisa, you're new to the area. You don't have a resume. I've, I've been talking to six other people who've been doing it for 20 years. You didn't hear one of those objections, yet you're still saying it. So the actual evidence is oftentimes unbelievably contrary to what we're saying to ourselves. That's why I keep talking about this thing called the lens. Stop clouding your lens with all this crap that's not real. Does that make sense? Well, I keep trying to envision that that's going to go through because I didn't get any major objection that I thought might possibly happen on an appointment like that. But the fact is, is I've been calling him for the past two and a half months and have only been able to leave him messages. And so at what point does it get to where it's annoying, where he's not even going to want to talk to me? Okay, great question. That's a great question. I keep calling it's, him, it, and it, yet I don't want him to lose contact. It's a great question. Two months is nothing for follow-up time in this digital age. Okay, because these people want to, uh, uh, you want them, I want them to perform one of the largest emotional and, and financial transactions in their lifetime. We have no patience because we need to get to the 100,000. I get it. Okay. However, what we need to do is go back to that last conversation, that last meeting. And you can never walk away from this without knowing this. What is their presumed timing? When do they perceive that they will be doing something so that we can then subsequently decide the answer to your question? Okay, I have developed five buckets for my follow-up. I'm going to ask you, when do you think you might be ready to sell this probate property? To which he would reply, what? He was thinking January, February time. Okay, this January or February? He currently is using the house to stay in. Okay, so this... 
Yep. So this January, February, that guy, and when did you first talk to him? Uh, it was in October. Okay, so you talked to him in October. He would have been, for me, somebody that was in that 30 to 90 day time frame for making a decision. I would have done two things, and you will too. Number one, you need to upgrade the offer to him. Okay, you need to upgrade the offer. No matter how we found him, no matter how he invited us into the conversation on the phone, we have to say, look, if you're thinking about doing this, I'm going to let you know we sent you out our seven-step plan. That will help you pre-plan. One met with him specifically yep. and showed him the plan. Good, okay, good. Now, when you left, what was your upsell or your upgrade of information that you offered him the minute you walked out? Anything? Okay, so I got to try to think back because that was a while ago. Um, the one thing I did when we were walking through the house is I happened to look up and see there was a water spot, and I asked him if he was aware of it, which he wasn't. So that was kind of the one thing where I was able to help him possibly, you know, avoid a huge problem because if he's not living on the property and there's a water leak on the roof and we were just coming into our rainy season, you know, it's All right, I got it. 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 Hold on. I want to, I want to edit all that out. I got it. Good for you. Okay. Stay in the hot seat. Leslie, I heard your voice. You there? Yes. Okay. This is where you become the teacher from only 24 hours ago. Okay, ladies are going to learn how to lift each other up here. Gail, you can come in after they've done helping each other. Here we go. All right. Okay. You yeah. were in a situation, Leslie, where I asked you a question yesterday and I need to give the same advice to Lisa right here. Okay. When she was sitting in the house, he needs to be clear of what seven points. Please walk me through. The plan, the plan when, when he goes to sell the, includes. The seven point strategic plan. Say them, please. Walk me through them. What are they? Well, the first thing is pricing it right. The second is addressing the condition of the property, like that, that roofing issue potentially. Good. Three. Identifying what could be fixed. The third is staging it, having professional stage it so it looks its best so that when you take the, you memorialize it. Beautiful. Four. With digital photography. Say the words. Say the words for four. Hold on. No, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Say the word at number four. You segued beautifully, but you missed the highlight. Marketing. Thank you. Say it. Leslie. Oh, marketing. Say it. Yeah. <laughs> we, you, 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 marketing. Your, your narrative is beautiful. Okay. So go back. And try it again when you had the, the staging. Pause, say the category, and bring me through it. Keep going. So after we stage it, professionally stage it so that it looks its best, then we, then we go to marketing. And when it's looking its best, we memorialize it with professional digital photography. So then when we syndicate it on the MLS and it goes out to all the websites, it looks its very best. Brilliant. Keep going. Five. Then, then we have, as, that way we get as many people interested and in coming and actually seeing the property, buyers actually interested, and that will increase the number of offers that we can start Say the, the word. communication you, about. There, there you go. Good. Say the word right away. That will start communication. Communi oh, right, right. Then the communication starts. We have people in the house, buyers, because we've made it look so great. They are interested in the property. The buyers are there. Then with the idea of getting feedback, we get the feedback so that we can know that if we need to adjust anything Beautiful. with regard to the condition or the staging or Beautiful. the price. Brilliant. And Six. Which will lead us to get offers, real offers from buyers, which takes us to negotiation. So then we have a chance. We have real offers to negotiate, and that will take us to working through to a closing and selling your property at the highest possible price. Okay, perfect. 
Bravo. Good job. So much better than 24 hours ago. Lisa, I would have expected that in the house, you would have gone through that in an infographic supported by maybe even the full printed page. And I, you would have been live doing this saying, look, I have the pricing at right range here with me. So that's why I came over today to take a look at the actual hyper local stuff that a Zillow can't do. I'm here to see the exact condition, location, and go over hyper local market trends. So you can see here's the price range. Now, if you want to move up, see things like that ceiling and other things, you want to start to do those now. If you need my contractors, I'll get them for you. Now, whether we use a professional stager or not, that's something that I can arrange for you when you get a little bit closer and you've done the reconditioning stuff, right? But since you're not quite ready, well, let me finish. Since you're not quite ready, what I'm going to do is upgrade the level of information you're getting to because the number one thing that will affect the change in the price will be what comes on in sales between now and February. So I'll be putting you directly into MLS to get properties as they sell around this one so you can stay up on the trends. So when it gets closer, I can come back and reinterpret this for you because it will not be exactly the same as it is today. Go ahead. Who is that, Laura? You trying to weigh in? Yes. Yeah. I, I just actually have a personal quick question that is going along with the lines of what you're talking about. Yep. For a property like you saw today, that is a teardown. So condition and staging, I mean, the condition is awful and staging is pointless. What would you say would be the best way to market that property? That's an excellent question. Laura and I, by the way, if you don't know which Laura this is, this is my Laura, um, who I take claim to and don't you, any of you try to get her away from me, right? So 12 years later, Laura and I, <laughs> Yeah, this is our, this is how we do it together. So today, Laura has one of those unique opportunities where as a, as a dedicated inside sales agent, she has the opportunity to go out and list the property. She has a family property that's come up. So we went out there this morning and our assumption, both of us that look at this, is what we say is, okay, we this is a teardown because there's a fantastic dock here. It's a stucco cement looking house. Okay. Now, what her family and what your family does not want to hear is it's a teardown unless they have stated that, okay? That's what we say. We have to be very, very, very careful when we state something like that because there may be, although it wouldn't be you or I, there may be somebody that can't wait to pay for 500000 as is where is. We don't know that. We don't know that. So we can't make assumptions. It's so much safer to offer guidance and say, look, there are some challenges with this. This is not a very typical Cape Cod house. And let it pause. Let it linger. See how they react. Because you've also told me this guy built the house himself. So what's the worst thing you could say coming through the door? Oh, it's a teardown. Right? That's a, that's an insult to somebody. Well, Hold luckily, on. Luckily, the person who built it is not going to be there. He's no longer with us. Okay. But All right. All right, good, but hold on. Like, the problem is... Yeah, but hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold on. I have my aunt and uncles on one side and then you know, my father on the other. Yeah, so, so, hold, so hold on. Getting so, four people to agree on one thing is going to be another you, you, big challenge. You're not going to do that. That's not, your, that's not your job. Your job is to offer up, as we were saying earlier in the call, the same way we do this. Offer up the evidence. So what we do is we've done our analysis. We see how it affects it. Now, the most important part of the, the plan is to discuss step number one. I can't believe how many of us blow right through talking about price. It's just stunning to me how that is not the number one conversation in this industry. It is every day on Wall Street, but yet when it comes to another financial instrument that's many times bigger than a single share of stock, we blow right through price. It's number one to say, look, here's the property as is where hey, Daddy, it, can I? Hang on, hang on. Let me finish. I know you're excited, Lise. Hang on. It's where it's at as is where is today, Laura. And so that condition is what it is. What could it bear as a non-teardown? is beat number one. So if we're going fishing for this, we're looking at this. Now, we're not going to call that an extraordinary level of, of condition. It's not. Exterior-wise of the house, we haven't even been in it. Interior, I'm sure, it just feels dated. It's old. It's everything. It will feel overwhelming. So they are going to trade at the lower end of the pricing at right range, as is where is. So you're going to use the evidence to say, 
because of all those things that are challenging, yes, the doc is a massive plus. Yes, that's a wonderful thing, okay? It's great. However, the house is so overwhelmingly old and dated, it will bring us back down to the lower end of the range, probably. So if we overprice this, and we're looking at this plan, look, we did our best that we could to pick the price. Now we went in there and we said, hey, can you recondition anything? Can you clean the yard? Can you deep clean the house? Can you get rid of all the personal stuff? That is reconditioning, Laura. So if somebody can put some muscle into it, then they should be suggesting that that happens, right? Now, as far as staging is concerned, we don't have to have a professional stager. We just have to go in and move the stuff around that's in there, albeit from 1960 or whatever it is, move it around. The essence of these pieces of furniture, et cetera, is to set the space to show what it could be for somebody else. So yes, you can still do that, right? You can still do that. Now, even if it was worse than the one we saw today, let's say it is definitely a teardown. Things are falling down. Nobody really wants to go in. There's dead animals inside. You can still recondition that. You can still clean the yard to set the space. You can still have a disaster company go in and pull everything out. So at least they're walking through and around the site and it's been enhanced. Anybody can do that stuff. Does that make sense? I Yes, I'm right here with you. Go ahead, Laura. Come on. I think I was also going to suggest, because I'm working with some investors that are in that same boat where they're looking at properties with teardown. So what I do is I go and I pull the vacant land around and find what the price of the vacant land is and then try to find as close a comparable with houses on them. So even if they're only all you know nicer homes nearby, you can find a range in between that vacant land price and what the price of with land with a home on it is. And that way you can kind of find a middle ground and have a varying price range depending on what the cost of remodeling that house versus tearing it down. Yeah, let's 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 just tell you this. In our marketplace, if you can find vacant land, God bless you. You found something very, very, very difficult. Okay. But 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 good advice and the way to do that and the way that we did it today is I said, okay Laura we know because we work with a builder exactly and we did a modular one of our clients did a modular just now so we do know exactly the range that somebody would spend on top of this after the teardown we know that we know that oh gosh within like three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars plus or minus can't remember the number that um, one of our preferred builders who really can deliver an exact number could do that so now if somebody wants five hundred thousand for this teardown is it a 500,000 plus teardown cost lot? Well, we had at the back into that, we stand on the street and I do a spinorama and what do I see? I see tiny cottages. I don't see anywhere near where that neighborhood could bear the cost of $500,000 lot plus the cost of new construction to get a reasonable house. Not even close. So the danger for this retail buyer is that the more that we have to knock down the value of the, you know, the, the house sale itself, they're ending up, I mean, it's really painful for a seller to swallow that it's just the land cost. That's very difficult. So what do I re recommend here? I recommend a very forthright and honest approach, as we always do, but it's going to be a little bit more aggressive that says, look, we will exhaust trying to sell it as is where is because there is value to an existing house. Assuming it's not condemned and it's livable and it's operational, there's value to that. And to the investor who could bring it to livable, livable there's value. So without it, there's no house value whatsoever. Maybe that releases a little bit more land value because the house is already gone, but it's a real tricky situation. So what do you do? You walk the ladder down. You take a look at a less than average house. You list it, but you own that conversation with them and say, look, don't come back and beat us up when you can hear the wind blow here. We're trying to get you as the client the max value. But if the max value... Leslie, where's my gal, right? If we start going around that pinwheel and we have no communication, Leslie, if after the marketing and everything's up there, the pictures of the dock selling that, fix it up or tear it down, whatever you want to do, look at this beautiful dock and nobody comes. What do we have, Leslie? What do we have? An overpriced house. Leslie, what do we have? 
Unmute your mic, Leslie. Come on, stay in the hot seat. Where'd she go? Right when you need them. We have a problem with the plan, and it's probably an overpriced house. According to Laura, she would be right in this case because tumbleweeds and, and nothing is definitely the wrong price. So all you have to do is go back up the ladder and say, well, is it price? Or are these, you know, coming and the communications, oh my God, we're coming here and the communication is a teardown. Then we need to recondition it or lower the price or both. So that's really what happens here is that we have the safety of this plan. It's, I'm depressed that I lost Leslie here. I don't know what happened, but the point I'm is, here. all right. I'm here. Okay. Did you hear what I said then? I go back from the Facebook page to the phone to the Facebook okay. page to the phone and there's a gap. All good. So the bottom line is, if I'm sticking to that plan, I set it up as clearly and as aggressively clearly as possible without scaring them, right? Because what I'm saying is, look, I'm saying I have a plan. You and I, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, are in this together. We are going to follow these seven steps. And when they go correctly, guess what we end up at? A successful closing and you become a happy griffin. That's the plan. So along the way of this plan... If something goes awry, the plan will start screaming to us, something's wrong. And, and what it will be at is most likely the communicative style, right? I mean, that stage or module. We price it in the range. We recondition it the best we can to move up the range. We move furniture around or we bring in stagers. We, we memorialize it the best we can on that day and put it out to the web with syndication marketing. Then we get off. You missed one beat on that. You get off your bum and you go in there and you open house it and you push it around social media. That's called push marketing. Now, with all those four stages in full effect, if you can hear those tumbleweeds rolling down the street, meaning no co-brokes are calling to show it to their folks, nobody came to your open house, nobody's calling on your sign, you have a problem. That's communication. Silence is some of the most powerful communication when it comes to listing and marketing at home. Now we have to go back up and have a power. Look, it's been two weeks. Nobody. It's been three weeks. The alarm should be screaming 30 days in. Houston, we have a problem. And we're going to go back and look at it. It's a pricing problem. We're not... Danny. Well, hold on. Danny. Yeah, hang on. We're not close enough in the price range that we determined given the features. Okay, ladies, come on. Go ahead. If you, if we can backtrack just a minute when we were sure. talking about that, the million dollar house, you said there were two things that I should do at the end. One of them was to upgrade the offer. Yes. Which when sitting down with him, I did, we went over the price Good. because it was a probate situation. I also offered him a couple of other bonus services as far as helping him with the personal property, bringing in a cleaning crew. Good. And, Bravo. you know, in addition to the seven steps. So what well, was hold the on. second hold on. thing that I could have hold done on. on that? Those are not in addition to. Categorize okay. them. Those were all conditioning things that you just said. I'll bring in a clean team. What else did you say? Watch me categorize them for you. They would just deeper dive into that category. Personal property. Would say that again? Yeah. Say it again? The personal property. The because he wasn't sure if he wanted the personal property. He wasn't sure if he wanted to sell. That's conditioning. Like he wanted to sell all of the furniture with the house. That's conditioning. But he wasn't sure if somebody wanted to I got buy all the furniture. And so I kind of on the fly said, well, you know, we can also liquidate the furniture and do an estate sale if you're interested in that, or we could take the, all the furniture off property and sell it like in an I got auction it. type situation. I got it. I got it. All I wanted to do was categorize it. You don't have to tell me the narrative you told him. Brilliant. He's the guy. I'm just your guide. You know what I say? All you have to do is put a category over it. Oh, as part of the reconditioning, we offer a full fleet of services. Number one, we can help you dispose of your property and monetize it in the meantime. Number two is, once that's all done, we can bring you in a, a clean team and organize that for you. Bang, that's it. You're done. Brilliant. Bravo. You did it. But don't get, look, it's, it's, you can't get off outside the guardrails. The guardrails are the plan. You're executing a plan live. By that time, you're not telling them about it on the phone. You're actually executing it live. You're in the home showing the price range. You're talking about the things that you could recondition or he could. And then when he gets stuck, you notice these other things that say, oh, by the way, there's a couple other services for reconditioning we offer. You did it. Brilliant. Bravo. Just give it, you know, like be careful of too much narrative. And, I, and I'm only cutting you off quickly here. Because I love the narrative if I'm the guy, but I'm the coach. And what I'm saying is don't get lost as to where you are. Now, now, 
to answer the other part of your question. By the way, well, I said this one, number one. Number one beat was, let me upgrade the information that's coming to you. The continuity is very important. The minute you walk out the door, he begins to forget you, Lisa. All of your, your goodwill starts to atrophy. That's just human nature. We can't remember five minutes ago, right? And now the rest of his life happens. So he begins to forget what you say. So you need continuity of relationship without bugging him. So you say, look, I'm going to take your information, put it into MLS, and I'm going to be sending you instantly. Every time a property sells or lists around you, both, they're going to come to you. Pay more attention to the ones that sell because that's going to affect this trading range, this price range. Pay attention to those. And by the way, I'll check in with you periodically. So now there's your five buckets. You have to set a reminder, and I have an incredible cheat system because I built in Infusionsoft my ability to remind me that while he's getting those sold properties as they sell around him, I have a system to remind me, oh, that's the frequency for that guy. Remember him? He was the one with the probate. He said he wasn't going to do something until January, February from October. I think... I should probably be in touch with him every two weeks. And being in touch with him every two weeks is in addition to MLS doing its job and sending him sold properties. And then also, and Freda has this all set up for Paul's team, all the educational emails going out to this guy on a weekly frequency. So there's two layers of information that are really important to him as a seller of a property. Now you are able to come in to supplement that without bugging him. Hey, Danny, it's Lisa. Just checking in. I saw that there was another property that listed right around the corner. Let's keep an eye on that. Just want to let you know. And you don't have to talk to him every time. Leave a message because you have relationship now. So there's not a desperado feeling. So let's hit those beats again. Number one, get him in MLS for the, to the extent that there will be continuity of hyper-relevant information to his price with the knowledge that that's going to affect the real price you guys choose down the road. See, too many people go in, leave a price, and don't express that that's not the price. That's where it could be today, and that's the range. So you need me 60 to 90 days out to pay attention to this. And the way I'll keep you up to date is I'll be sending you solds and actives, but pay attention to sold. Beat number two is the frequency that you decide is right. Right, Goldilocks? Which bed is just right? Am I calling him weekly? Well, probably if he's inside of 60 days and making a decision. Am I calling him bi-weekly? Probably 60 to 90. Am I calling him monthly? He's longer than 90. Bi-monthly or quarterly because he's two years away from retirement. So I have actually five buckets I've developed so that we can be as hyper-relevant as possible. Back in the day when technology wasn't as good, the premise was if they say they're ready, then call them back in half the time. Well, I don't love that with the ability today to be able to send that continuous information and be a little bit more hyper-relevant. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Extremely helpful. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Who wants to weigh in here? Who's next? I got some more time here. You got Gail, you want to weigh, weigh in on that? Gail? One. Can I? ask one quick question? Absolutely, Leslie. Go ahead. So, I connected with this guy on the, he, he's house expired listing. The last price was $2,250,000. I connected with him on LinkedIn um, and Good. he said, well, I have been contacted by all of the top realtors in Birmingham yeah. and if I listed with you, they would kill me. It's not yeah. play that. Yeah. What, what I say to that? Okay. What, what do you mean they would kill you? Are they, are they are they friends of his? I don't know. I mean, tight community or what? I, I that that's how it's a tight community. It's a very small community here. Birmingham is just a little. Yeah, I don't. Okay. All right. Let's so let's just let.